Welcome. It's, it's great to see Full House again, really. Um, welcome to our 12th INOG. I had to write this down because nobody remembers the exact values of hex digits, right? <laughs> anyway, so this is INOG CR, our 12th meeting, if you can believe it, in about two years now. We started in, in, in August two years ago or thereabouts. So really awesome that we got to this basically. Uh, we're really, really, really appreciative of uh, everybody's efforts to support the community. Um, so as usual, um, there are a few bits and bobs I'm gonna mention quickly. Um, as you might have noticed, we have our resident photographer, master photographer here, Jose. Um, we have the awesome AV team here, led by Ron and Christopher, uh, taking video of tonight. If anyone doesn't want their image or sounds immortalized on the internet, please let us know. Otherwise, um, please put your phones on silent during the talks. And uh, when asking questions, we will have a catch cube in purple over there. We'll throw it to you. Uh, so make sure you have your best game on. Um, and state, please, your first name before you ask your question so we know who you are. And even if you know who, who you are, we'll, we'll probably have plenty of newcomers. So just remember to state your name. Um, a bit about interacting with the, with the community. So if you want to get in touch with us, obviously we have inoc.net, the website, which has links to pretty much everything else. Um, we have uh, a Slack team where we hang out, post some things, and usually organize meetings. Um, we have a Twitter account so and an email address, which is on the website, admin at inoc.net, if you want to drop us a message about anything else that Donald's gonna talk at the end of the meeting. I'm pointing there, but I, I don't see a Donald. He's there, okay. <laughs> um, quickly about the agenda. Okay. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine, I remember. There are two parts to this evening. The first one is me talking forever, and, and then you'll get some interesting talks. And uh, about half of the rest of the night is social time. So please um, have a chat with someone you don't know have a chat with someone you know, um, disclose company secrets, talk dirty about your colleagues, all that good stuff. Um, we'll be wrapping up about 9.30 and uh, that's a hard stop. So we'll be reminding you because, you know, having a good time usually uh, doesn't go very well with watching the clock. Uh, but just so you know, about 9.30, we're, we'll have to be out of here. Um, our agenda had one small change at the last minute. So unfortunately, Amanda couldn't make it because of a foot injury. So uh, we wish her to get well soon and we'll see her talk at the next INOC for sure. She was gonna talk to us about the realities of DevOps life. Um, many thanks to Brian who stepped in uh, to, to, do a, to do one of his own talks and I won't spoil his, his topic because I'm looking forward to understanding more about it as well. So, um, <coughs> In terms of talking to people, um, I would like to just have the members, like the members of the PC, the program committee of INOG, stand up, please. So if you're new and you don't have anyone to talk, about, talk to and you don't know what's going on, please have a chat to, to one of these guys, Brian, Lork, and Mick, Donal. Um, they will be very happy to tell you what thing wh what what this meeting is about and how to make the most of it. Um, right, so um, we have a code of conduct for anything that has to do with INOG, and I'm going to read it to you because it's quite important to us that it, it is respected by everyone, and it applies to any interaction with INOG, be it online or in person at our meetings. So our code of conduct, uh, it's available in its full form on our website as well. Uh, in short, it's be excellent to each other, uh, which means that our group is dedicated to providing a friendly, safe, and harassment-free experience for everyone. 
Regardless of gender, gender identity and expression, age, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or, or lack thereof. Um, I think right now you're, you're not completely, you haven't escaped me forever, but uh, I will hand over to, to Alan here who will tell you very shortly what Amazon is doing around here and uh, a, a bit about the place. So over to Alan. Thank you. Uh, so I have the probably the easiest job of the evening, which is to welcome you all. Um, Amazon's very pleased to be hosting the INOG, um, and I hope you all have an enjoyable evening. Um, there are two reasons I'm particularly pleased to be giving the, the opening remarks. One is personal. So I've worked for Amazon for 12 years now, um, but before that I've do uh, done what you might call a full tour in the industry. And this is really sort of for my own entertainment, to s see how many people remember these logos. This is a test of how old you are, really. <laughs> uh, how far back can you go? Bonus points for anybody who can identify the technologies involved in the bottom two. Um, more seriously, um, on the Amazon side of the house, um, networking is and operations in the networking space are very important to Amazon um, and has a long history here in Dublin. Um, you may not know, but the Amazon office here, which is funny enough, 12 years old, um, was started as a systems and network operations center. Um, so networking is very much in our local DNA. Um, we've grown a bit since. Um, the last public figures were over 1,800 in the country, um, and we're growing fast in Dublin and elsewhere. Um, on the networking side, um, our teams in Dublin do everything, design, build, code, deploy, operate, um, stuff all across. Uh, and there's lots of other technical stuff going on here. Um, but I won't bore you with, with specific details about any of that. If you want to find out anything about Amazon, there's plenty of people in Amazon t-shirts around. Round of applause for Amazon for actually hosting us. <laughs> I think they've done an amazing job tonight, so really happy. Um, so my last bit and then I'll shut up. Um, basically, we'd like to give uh, proper recognition to a member of our community who showed us that basically there's, there's more to us than our job titles. Um, he is a network engineer. That's what he does by day, but by night, he's actually a very talented graphic artist who jumped at the opportunity uh, when we were looking for someone to design stickers for INOG. Um, so we're, we're really happy to actually give him the opportunity to, to talk to you about what it was like to design and come up and bring to life our favorite characters, Bash Bunny and Fiber Fox, and to a certain extent put up with me and Donald's uh, suggestions and not shutting up. <laughs> so uh, that said, here's Mr. Barry Keegan, looking the wrong way, uh, <laughs> uh, who, will, who will tell you the story of Bash Bunny and Fiber Fox. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you, you can all hear me, yeah? Cool. Um, yeah, my name is Barry Keegan. Um, I work as a network engineer for a company called Planet 21 Communications. Um, <coughs> networking would be one of two passions that I have. The other is illustration. I used to have another career where I worked in computer games. I was a 3D artist. I've had uh, published work as a comic book artist. I've well, I'm in the process of working on a graphic novel. These are some sample pages for it. Um, I'm hoping to release that this year. It's called The Bog Road, so keep an eye out for it. Um, but basically, where am I going with this? Um, about, well, a good few months ago at a previous INOG, 
I was talking to Donald and um, he learned of this other skill set I had. So quite quickly after that, himself and Christian approached me and asked would I work with them in creating and designing the INOG logo. So, um, so yeah, I, I was happy to do it, obviously. Um, so what they did was they, they gave me a brief and uh, what but I suppose a brief is more like a, a roadmap or some guidelines as to where we want to take it and, and what the, the end target would be like. And it was really to have something fun with a kind of an anime feel to it. It portrayed an open community, had ties with Ireland where the, the community was formed, I suppose. Um, and then just to have like tech, networking, automation feel in there. Um, now just to talk about tying it with Ireland, we definitely wanted to avoid obvious stereotypes. And like what everyone's probably thinking is maybe something like that. <laughs> um, so we really didn't want to go down that route at all. Um, so what I thought was about cave paintings and every country or land or continent, the, the animals are, can always kind of define that area. So we thought to ourselves, why not bring a few animals in marry them up with some tech, maybe some automation, some bash fiber, and um, just kind of sell it that way, tied in with, connected with Ireland a bit on that side of things. Like, now, if, let's say, we were in Russia or America, you know, we could have went with some awesome creatures like a falcon and a bear, like, you know. But, uh, you know, Ireland, we don't have any kind of big animals like that, so we were stuck with a fox and a bunny. Um, <laughs> But you know, they, I think they're quite interesting and they fit in with uh, tech, you know, you don't have to be a big powerful thing to, uh, to do tech like. So I suppose in designing anything really, whether it be a network or a, an app or some tool for your daily task, like you need to sketch things out, rough things out and try and come up with as many ideas as possible. And if you're working with colleagues, it's good to kind of get them on board and make them feel happy about the direction that things are going in. So like the idea here is, like, excuse the language, if you throw enough shit at the wall, something will stick, you know? So apologies for the language, I hope I didn't offend anyone there, but uh, this was what this idea was, like just to get the guys to have a look and see, you know, what they liked, what we all liked. And the one image that seemed to kind of stick out was the two kind of animal creatures surrounded by a, a, an automation robot, you know, something like that. And it, it gave a feeling of community and togetherness. Like, so when everyone was happy enough for what direction it was going in, and I, I suppose another good piece of advice when you're designing something is at a certain point, you should jump forward in the design quite far. And the idea behind this is, is like a lot of people, they don't know what they want. People find it very hard to kind of describe something, but they definitely know what they don't like. So sometimes, like what I done here was I jumped forward in the design, put some color in there, you know, just to really kind of, I suppose, make a statement and say, this is where it's going, to try and get a reaction from the guys and see what they thought. And, you know, they, they really liked that design. So, like, even though it was getting on its way, we still had a ways to go before we got to the final design. And uh, at this point, I suppose thi this here would have been like the, the last stage of big decision making and it was to try and lock down the automation robot, like, you know, just give some different looks and to see what everyone thought and which, which worked and which didn't work. And then also in there, like, uh, like if you look at say figure B, you can see the fox, he's holding fiber in his hand, but it's kind of obscuring the robot or it, the bunny in, in figure D, like, you know, she's, looking more at the group, whereas in the other figure, she's not really looking at the group. So kind of when you, when you put some different options out there, it can kind of form the idea even more and push it in that direction you want to go. So like after this stage, I kind of just pushed ahead with the final design. But like even when you feel like you're at the end, you can always, you know, see some unforeseen circumstances. And um, when we got to this point, we, I suppose, the, the bash bunny, who's you can see here zoomed in, is, is a girl or a woman, and uh, she has eyelashes. But when you print that out on a very small laptop sticker, it was quite difficult to see that that is a, is a woman. Like So from the feedback from the women of the INOG, uh, who we ran this by, like, they suggested you know, making a few amendments. So like 
what we done was, you know, bigger eyes, the bow and the hair, you know, a bit of frill in the top, like, and you know, they were quite happy with that, like, so, like, really after that, we were finished, and we came to the final design, and uh, I think the guys were really happy with it. I hope everybody else likes it and identifies with it, and it sums up the community, um, and that's it, really, if, if anybody has any questions. You can talk to me later if you want, but, and if you want to reach out to me on Slack, my uh, username is Keegan B, and, or you can reach, reach me on Twitter, which is at Barry Keegan, so uh, if there's no other questions, I'll, I'll go. Cool, thanks. So, my name is Brian Nisbet. I'm the Network Operations Manager for HEANet, which is the Irish National Research and Education Network. Those of you who uh, heard Orla McGann's talk at INOG 9, ish um, will of course know exactly who HN is uh, and we'll be able to pass the test we're going to be setting later um, so what I want to talk today about is uh, talks entitled creating an NREN in a commercial world which I'll, I'll, I'll describe in just a moment very briefly HENet there's the mission statement we also have a company song obviously but fundamentally what we do is we provide internet connectivity to all of the universities, institutes of technology, primary and secondary schools in the country, and also a whole bunch of other um, agencies and companies like the EPA and the SRI and the National Cancer Research people down in Cork. Um, internet connectivity is our first ever service, and then since then, we've moved into a lot of other services. Um, we provide hosting, we provide um, some some compute, uh, security services, et cetera. It's a whole portfolio of services that we now provide. And this would be fairly mirrored across national research and education networks across Europe. And there are, there's one in almost every country in the world at this point in time. They all have a lot of similarities. There are a few differences. Um, but what I was thinking about, really, when I was, I think, unfortunately, I think far too much about, about international research and education networks is I wanted to, to think what would have happened if we hadn't been created in the early 90s, if universities hadn't gone, let's band together and make a national research and education network. Um, what if we were in 2017 and everything else existed, this, this glorious edifice of, of, of compute and book selling, um, if all of the ISPs were there, if in the 80s and 90s the universities had gone with commercial ISPs to provide their connectivity, and if then in 2017 someone had said, hey, maybe we should build a national research and education network. So as, as, as some people know, because I talk about it too often, I used to be an historian and then I found it too difficult so I got into networking. <laughs> um, dates were really tricky. So this is a counterfactual, that's what us fancy people would call it, or a what if scenario as, as, as others might know it. Um, and it's exploring what that might look like, what it might look like if we all turned around today and said, let's set up an organization which just deals with education and research. So any good counterfactual has assumptions, and assumptions are important. Um, so first of all, regardless of how it's set up, everything's the same. Some, some NRENs, I'm gonna use the word NREN a lot, some of them are set up by the universities all joining together and going, hey, we, in fact, in the 90s it was all, we hate this ISO, this, this ISO model, um, we want IP, let's band together and, 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 and work together like that. Other times, such as in Bangladesh, recently enough, the government said, we should do this, all the cool kids are doing it, so we'll fund, a, we'll fund an NREN. It doesn't matter how it was set up, we think everything turns out roughly the same. One of the things a lot of NRENs are very familiar with is there isn't a lot of money at all, um, but there's enough, we get by. Some people get it from their universities, some people get it directly from government. In Ireland, we get a combination of the two. We have money from, from our members and money from government. But again, let's not worry about that. There's enough of it. And the big kind of important thing that we're seeing at the moment is when NREN started, the university IT departments were headed by people who built the network. They were headed by people who used to use CUCP and fibered everything up themselves and all the rest. What we're seeing a lot more now is we're seeing a lot more from the point of view of CIOs, service managers, people who are coming in and are looking at the services rather than the hardcore tech part of it. And again, the third assumption here is that that is the case in 2017, we build this NREN. So what do we do? 
you, you're, you're made a CEO of an NREN and someone gives you enough money to hire some people. What do you do? Well, you start with brokerage. Brokerage or collective negotiation or whatever you want to call it. This is the big thing you do. You start with saying, I'm not Trinity College with 25,000 students. I'm every university in Ireland with 200,000 students. Give me a better deal. Give me a better deal on my Microsoft products. Give me a better deal on my use of AWS or Google Computer or otherwise. And in fact, in, re in the real world, there was a pan-European tender on infrastructure as a service, which basically means AWS and Microsoft Azure and a few other people. Um, but it's getting cheaper egress charges, it's getting cheaper access to compute. And this is the big thing, collective bargaining is a, is a huge, huge thing. But you do that and you go, oh, we need to talk to our clients. So you hire a client services person. And then of course you realize every other company in the world has massive marketing departments that produce all of the lovely t-shirts you can see around you, be they Amazon t-shirts or Facebook t-shirts or whatever else. So if you're gonna operate in this, in this area, yeah, um, you really need to have your marketing and sales sorted. So you hire your three staff doing this. So it looks like brokerage, great. Group procurement, this is what we're talking about. Shared services, which means cloud services, and we'll talk a bit more of that in a moment. Some of you are familiar with the question mark, question mark, question mark. But importantly, we're still not talking about profit here. Um, we're still talking about a not-for-profit environment. So it's partnership. That's what you're trying to build with the universities, and this is vitally important. Because once you have that, once you have them on side and you have them trusting you, unfortunately, like all customers, they start asking what's next. Great, you've saved us millions of euro on brokerage, that's fantastic, that's now normal, that's run of the mill, what can you do for us today? What have you done for us lately? I don't mean to, 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 to paint my clients as ungrateful at all, because they're lovely and wonderful, but it's a normal question for them to ask. So, what are the services that come out next? And you'll notice, I haven't mentioned technology at all yet. And HEANet, the Irish National Research Education Network, highly technical company. Two thirds of our staff are technical. So now we begin to look at that. Mobility, mobility is what students want. They don't want to have to be in the university library to access their journals. They want to be able to do it in their apartment, they want to be doing it in the bus, they want to be able to do it in the park, it doesn't matter. They want to be able to access services everywhere. And we talk a lot about ubiquitous access to these services. It shouldn't matter whether you're in that situation or whether you're, for instance, in Galway City studying in GMIT or whether you're in Letter Frack on the Atlantic coast also studying in GMIT. You should have the same experience regardless of where you are. Now, in order to do that mobility, what's hugely important is identity services. We talk a lot now about single sign-on. So this NREN, the next thing it's doing, probably at roughly the same time as it's doing mobility, because the two are very tightly bound, is doing identity services, and is making sure that a student can identify themselves very easily, regardless of what website they log into. They don't need to be behind a certain block of IP addresses or otherwise to get to a journal. They have their identity, and they can access whatever their university says they can. And that could be their own email systems, Office 365 or Gmail, it could be a scientific journal, it doesn't matter. They only need to do it with that identity. And then of course you've got their trust. And they're like, oh, well you, could, you could start helping us with professional services. So you start potentially hiring technical staff, but not for your own services, to help advise your clients on theirs, to help sit on their side of the table when they're in negotiation um, with a firewall salesperson or a router salesperson or, or you know, a cloud services salesperson and give them the honest answer and give them the support and be on their side. This is a hugely important piece of partnership. Again, we haven't, we haven't built one service yet. We haven't plugged in one piece of fiber. Now very importantly, all of this has to be 24 by seven. We live in a 24 by seven world as, as everyone who works in networking knows. Education is no different. Um, any university these days is not just looking at the students who turn up in their own, their own building. They're also selling services to China and India and uh, America and all over the world, whether through virtual learning environments or through remote hubs. 24 by 7, everything has to be built on that. How do you do that? 
Well, you hire more people and things like that, but you know, this, this, is, this is the big question, absolutely. I haven't, I've just about mentioned the cloud. What's in the cloud? Everything's in the cloud. This NREN, this NREN that's set up in 2017, doesn't build one data center. They might have a server somewhere, maybe in their office, but they don't build one data center. Um, they're probably not gonna build any servers at all. They're gonna procure these services from the myriad of people out there um, who provide them. And maybe the universities still have their own VCs, some, some bits there, but why would you start setting out in 2017 to, to, to do that? But it's very important that you're being aware of the various issues. We have GDPR coming down the, the, the line, and this is gonna be huge. But also you can help your clients with migration of services to the cloud, which is another huge professional service that you're working with. I'm a networking guy. You're probably not building a network. You might buy a managed network from somebody else if you get to a point in your evolution where people are interested in that, but you're probably not building a national network the way HEA Net has. Now, it makes a huge amount of sense for us to keep our network, to build it, to improve it. But if you were starting today, you wouldn't do that. You might, again, there might be a, a situation where you start building out for primary and secondary schools to do it, but realistically speaking, the fiber, the, the routing engines and everything else is probably somebody else's problem. So what does that look like? I mean, you've seen all sorts of pyramids doing all sorts of things. This is the kind of pyramid that I'm looking at at this point in time. Brokerage is the huge bottom base part of this. Then you have those services, but those services are facilitating mobility. They're building kind of resource registries and things like that for single sign-on. And then you might have, and, and, and doing the professional services piece, and then you might have a very small element of tech on top of that, which is a huge inversion from what we see today. Now, I'm not saying this is the way national research and education networks should go. I'm not saying it's the way enterprise should go. But if I was starting today, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now. And I think that it's very important that we all, whether it's an NREN, whether it's an enterprise, when I say anything else, take a look at what is there and not purely act on received wisdom, not purely do what we, we would have done if we'd set up five or 10 or 15 years earlier and actually look at what's real and, and, and really examine those sacred cows um, and, and whether, whether we need to adhere to them. So that's a very, very short piece on all of that. Um, I'll be around, I'm more than happy to talk. We might have time for one or two questions now, I think. But um, there, there's a vision for a counterfactual and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you, everyone. Let's do the volume selfie first so I don't forget. Smile, like you guys are happy. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Mikel and myself are going to be talking today about some virtual networking implementation that we have at Facebook. Um, I'm a big fan of, if anybody has a question while we are doing this, just raise your hand. We we'll really have to wait at the end. It's a pretty informal crowd. Donald is, is not, you know, raging. So yeah, if, you know, if you guys need, stop us, right? So what's virtual networking, right? Um, who really knows these days? Right? So I'm sure if I go around the room and I ask 10 different engineers, I'm going to get 10 different answers, right? And you know, you'll have 10 different approaches of doing this, right? Like after all, we have all sorts of lovely protocols, right? Like, you know, who really doesn't love BXLAN or you know, regular VLANs, overlays, layer three VPNs, and of course, you know, the duct tape of networking, which is GRE, right? So when we started like our internal conversation about, you know, do we really need to do some sort of virtual networking, like do, you, do we actually have a use case, we decided to, instead of looking at the tech, let's actually focus on what's the problem we were trying to solve, right? Like what was our major use case that actually merit introducing this complexity in the network and what, were, what was going to be the benefit of it, right? And, you know, we had multiple use cases, but let's say that our major one uh, was essentially an application that we have that's called Tupperware, right? And Tupperware is our approach to the magic of containers. Containers are super popular, super fun, everybody likes them. We like them also, and in fact, we have Tupperware since you know, many, many moons ago, right? Miguel is you know, nodding with agreement, so yeah, many, many moons ago. If you wanna think about, you know, like if you want to like, translate what's Tupperware to like, you know, open source, like this is our best, let's call it approximation, right? Which is essentially Docker and, and Kubernetes, right? Essentially, you know, a package a system that will, you know, carry your particular task, you know, deploy microservices, you know, control your images, and then schedule this across your fleet, right? So, like, pretty 
pretty standard. When we started to deploy this, or when we deployed this many, many months ago, like our approach was, as you can imagine, right? Like we had, you know, a fleet of servers to do this, right? Like essentially, depending on the server and depending on the actual service, you might have a machine that would have, you know, a hundred of a hundred containers, right? And I'll, I'm going to use the 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 definition of process slash tasks slash containers interchangeable because in the in our case, like Topperware, a container in Topperware. Is my still good? Like the lighting. Uh, you know, we had like a dramatic drop. Um, somebody should get paid. Uh, basically, it's an interchangeable concept. So you know, if you hear me talk about process, and if you get, hear me talk about task, and if you hear me talk about containers, I'm actually referring to the same thing, and it's just my dyslexia doesn't let me, you know, just use one, right? And when we started deploying this, we would have that situation that I mentioned. We would have a host that would have a hundred essential, uh, will have a hundred containers, for example, but basically will have a single IP, which led to, you know, how do you actually do this when, you know, like 10 of those actually want to use the same port? Then you needed to introduce this handling of the complexity into the scheduler, right? Which was absolutely possible, but, you know, like it leads to some inefficiencies, and we said, okay, we can do better, right? So we decided that our containers needed two things that could be solved with applying some version of working, right? And, you know, essentially our first requirement was, okay, let's have a, an IP address per Unix process slash container slash task, right? Process is, you know, the, the simpler way of understanding this, right? And this, you know, really with B4, it's not viable. At that point already we were, you know, like we were, had exhausted, you know, B4 a long time ago, and we already had B6 everywhere, so we said, you know, V6 is awesome and, you know, it's what we use internally, so why, you know, let's just assign a V6 address to everything that now that we're at it, right? And let's keep it, you know, let's maintain that be part of each one of those processes, right? And we said to ourselves, okay, what about, you know, the cherry on top would be, like, if that task gets moved from one machine to the other, can we actually maintain that, right? Can we actually maintain that in a way that's not, you know, super heavyweight or super complex and essentially get IP mobility, right? So we, you know, so let's do that, right? Which is essentially the same concept as, you know, separating names from locators, which is a very uh, old concept in networking that's been in discussion for like the past two decades with different degrees of excitement and technology and, you know, technology keeps the ideas, the same ideas keep getting repackaged with different names and different headers and different ways, but it's exactly, exactly the same concept. Another interesting thing for this is that in most like uh, of this type of solutions, you have essentially silos, right? You have different virtual networks that live in isolation. In our implementation, this is flat, right? Like we get this, all the addresses come from the same pool and this is pretty flat and there's a, there's a diagram that kind of shows this better than I'm going to use a super pointer to kind of show, right? So our implementation for this is basically uh, ILA, right? And this is a proposal that Tom Herberg came up with. And, you know, basically it builds upon an, an old protocol called ILNP, right? with my dyslexia, I also am going to screw up the letters, so, you know, that's why we have slides, right? And this is a very old protocol that, you know, attempted to do something similar to what we're trying to do, but this, pro this protocol had some issues that I'm going to talk about, but essentially what we're trying to do is separate the two functions of network addresses, right? So basically the identification of network endpoints and assisting routing by uh, separating the topological information, and I said something Mikael doesn't agree, uh, or do you get your knowing? Okay, <laughs> Miguel wants to like throttle. Uh, so, you know, an IP address, gigantic space, right? So let's break this down into two halves. You know, we'll use the uh, upper 64 bits as uh, the locator that we'll use for actually routing packets and we'll use the bottom 64 bits as an identifier that doesn't really change, right? And the idea of this particular protocol in a nutshell is like the identifier remains the same, locators might change and we're going to see this, you know, explained in a little bit, right? or at least how we implement this in ILA. We use, or uh, ILNP use DNS heavily to actually accomplish this. So now let's talk about why this protocol, you know, wasn't really actually implemented. It really didn't take off, right? And essentially what happens with this is that, you know, the transport layer needs to be aware of those locators, right? So for this, you need to implement new extension headers, new ICMP messages, and, you know, that essentially boils down to you need to change the TCP stack, right? which essentially meant that, hey, you need to change. In the case of this particular protocol, the main drive behind it was essentially, oh, there were a lot of peers like 15, 16, 18 years ago. Yeah? 
that the internet wasn't really going to scale, that there was a lot of fears that we, we were reached like the limits of FIB sizes and that you know, we needed to, to do some lateral thinking, right? That of course didn't happen, but you know, essentially one of the major problems was that this required you to change the TCP stack of the entire internet, which, you know, tricky, right? So how do we build upon the, some of the ideas of this protocol, right? ILA basically hides the locator changes from the transfer layer. So this means that you know, layer four doesn't need to know that this is happening and we're going to see the, the ma or well, I've actually explained on this slide, so we're gonna see how this actually happens, right? Uh, basically, you always have one fixed locator that we actually call the zero prefix and Mikhail is going to touch more on that. And again, when Tom actually did this proposal, he made an implementation in the Linux kernel and there's some IETF graphs, right? And the blue magic of this is that essentially we do stateless rewrites on the kernel, right? Which, yes, NAT is evil. NAT is evil, but in this case, it's stateless NAT, so it's less evil, right? And, you know, it allows us to not have to change the entire TCP stack, which is good, right? So what are some of the host requirements that you need for ILA? Well, you know, every host needs a routable locator, essentially a, a slash 64 prefix, and I have some diagram that's going to explain this better. Hosts need to basically maintain a cache of those mappings, right? Which, yes. That essentially, you know, think about the same concept of an ARP cache or an ND cache, right? Like hosts maintain this to know how to keep track of like those different uh, mappings, right? And it has something that ILMP didn't have, at least, you know, the old school version. I think there the was something in 2011 that actually implemented something similar to this, or at least at a proposal level, which is a way of communicating non-ILA hosts with ILA hosts, right? You know, something that allows you to communicate between devices that you actually have migrated and devices that are in transition, which, which gives you a mechanism to like gradually experiment and like actually move your fleet, right? So, diagram, which I get to use the magical stick. Give me the stick. And I, so, yeah, that's gonna be, that's why I needed a pointer. So we have a serial prefix that probably then works well, right? So this is, let's call it an ILA machine, right? So this is one host. This host has a one process, one container. It could have whatever it needs, right? That process has an identifier. Let's call it one, two, three, four. So the actual virtual address, the ILA address, will be our serve prefix plus the process ID or the container ID or the task ID or whatever. And I have a normal locator. That's what the network knows how to route, and everything is happy, right? So the application that I have in that container decides to send some traffic out. Uh, let's call it to this other guy, which is essentially a mirror, right? Same thing, another container. You have the serial prefix, and I think it's raining, or somebody's clapping from the outside. Uh, the processor ID, my locator. Go back one. Well, yeah, I think you're gonna, yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. One more. Yeah, it's fine. So basically, what happens is when I send the traffic, right? it gets sent, the application doesn't know about this locator address. The application is transparent. That's the part where TCP doesn't need to know, right? So traffic gets sent, the source destination are essentially this address and that address there, right? When this gets to the kernel le level, the kernel actually does that stateless rewrite where basically changes the destination uh, to be, you know, a routable IP, right? This is an IP that when I put it on the wire, the routers don't really need to know anything because this is like your normal network, right? Like this is not the non-virtual part of this, right? And then you get to click again. And then when it actually gets to host number two and it gets to the kernel, the kernel actually does a swap, right? So, you know, now we go back to my destination was rewritten so I could route it over the network. When it gets to the host, the host has that cache that I mentioned before, and this gets swapped. And then it gets to that container, your application, your microservice, whatever, and that didn't have any knowledge that this just happened. So you get to click, magical diagram, click again. So basically you can think about it, ILA essentially gives you one big cloud, a slash 64 subnet that you can just get from anywhere to anywhere, right? And all you need to do is like fill the requirements and now Mikael is going to continue explaining some more details. You want this or do I leave it there? Yeah. Cool. Hello. Hey. Okay. <coughs> so the so Jose mentioned something about the serial prefix, how we, how we use this prefix to basically use it in the transport layer. So SIR stands for Standard Identifier Representation, and it's a 64-bit fixed locator. 
Uh, and this is the, the actual first 64 bits that are seen, in the are seen in the network for all the packets. So these, these SIR prefixes are injected by the concept of ILA routers that are gonna go deeper later on. And we kind of scale them in an anycast fashion. So let me give you an example here. So we have a, on the left, we have ILA hosts where we can see the, let me see if I can make, this is not a, how can I make this thing small? This is what they're seeing. No, no, this thing is not. Okay, it's fine. Um, so we have the ILA, ILA host in the left and we can see um, the top one has uh, ID 1234, um, the, the bottom one has ABC, right? So we, we have an ILA router in the middle and we need to communicate the non-ILA host with ILA host, right? So the ILA host between them can send the, the traffic directly, right? But between the non-ILA host and the ILA host, they need to go through the router. So the ILA router injects the SIR prefix into a network, which is this Facebook slash 64. Um, the non-ILA host talks to the router using the ID. And, and this router is responsible to the for the translation, right? Uh, as you can see, the traffic goes through the router for this direction, right? One good thing, and this is very important for scaling reasons, the communication in the other direction is very similar to DSR in load balancing. It doesn't go through the ILA router again. So in summary, right, the ILA router needs to know about all the active mappings in the network, injects the slash 64 into the network to attract this traffic for non-ILA hosts to be able to talk to ILA hosts. And basically, is the proxy between the ILA world and the non-ILA world, right? This is really important to be able to make this roll out a reality other than a PowerPoint, right? So what about the control plane, right? So we had to disseminate these mappings across the network, right? Uh, so now that we saw how the ILA router does the conversion, we still need to disseminate those mappings, right? So we can go in different ways here, right? We can use a push model, which is, um, we can think about BGP as a push mechanism, as a protocol. I mean, we have updates, we have withdrawals, and I don't know, BGP is, is pretty known, right? We all know BGP, scales pretty well. And then we have the other model, more like DNS, which is pool model, right? So generally the pool models, pool systems are more complex because you need to deal with things like cache invalidations and stuff like that, but they scale better, right? Uh, on our side, we decided to go with the BGP model because we actually think it's simpler just to push everywhere, operational-wise, right? So how, how do we implement this, right? So the ILA host uh, always push into the mapping system. So the ILA host themselves publish these mappings to the, to the system, right? And the ILA host and routers know all about all the mappings, right? This might sound that is uh, huge and might not scale, but I mean, so far it's working well for us. O okay, so let's get into the mobility piece. So let's say we have this situation. We have a flow between host C and host B, right, which is ID 5678-1234, right? And let's say that that task or that process moves to host A, right? So at that moment, the way we implemented this, to be totally frank, in that exact moment, we are, we are dropping packets. So C is still sending the packets to B, right? So basically, at that point, the schedule L removes the mappings, and the actual host that gets the new ID pushes the mappings to the, to the network to actually disseminate this, right? And you might say, well, this might not be ideal because we are losing packets in that transition. The reality is that for us, the time that takes to uh, actually deploy a new task is in an order of a minute or so, is actually longer than the time that the push happens, right? So 
For us, it's actually simpler to accept that specific loss time because operationally it's much better, right? In reality, our services don't require that extreme non-packet loss situation. Right? So, and in the last step, the mapping gets republished and the flow recovers to go directly where it should be, right? Okay, so what about the deployment, right? How we made this happen? So the network setup, right? This required a pretty big uh, network configuration. Basically, we had to overlay a completely V6 address schema on top of the current one. We configure our, a bunch of SLAS64s per rack switch. We have a top of rack per, per rack. We didn't use anything fancy. We could use BGP, we could use whatever. We decided to go with the static routes, right? And you would say, well, this is crazy, right? Well, if you think about it, if you pre-compute all the possible combinations, we kind of cover all the network, all, all, all the possible servers in the rack. So what we basically can predict a given server, which is last 64 for ILA, will receive. We aggregate this as last 64 in a 54 per rack, a 46 per pod, which is a group of racks in our fabric terminology, and a 32, a slash 32 per building, right? Um, so how does this look in the host configuration? Uh, we have, a, as I said, a, a slash 64 per host in every machine at the moment configured. Uh, this is all, this configuration is all applied by Chef. And this is, and this, here you can see how it looks like in, in an IF, IF config, configuration, right? So there you can see the ILA prefix configured in the ETH0. And you might see a flag there that says deprecated. This is a really cool feature in Linux that you can use to actually set the lifetime preference of the, of the address. And this basically was key to allow us to deploy this in reality because as you deploy this addressing, you might not have the network infrastructure ready to receive these prefaces. You have the chicken and the egg problem. So with this, what we make sure is that the Linux kernel doesn't initiate a SIM connection or any connection originated by the box itself if no connection came in to that IP before. IP before, no IP before. <laughs> uh, so unique address per task, right? Um, we use this last 64 as a local pool. So now we have 64 bits to allocate multiple tasks per server. We don't need to deal with port allocation and all that nightmare. Now we can run thousands of web servers, for example, in the same port in the same machine because each task or each process will get a dedicated IP, right? We allocate, yeah, as I said, every task gets its own one. And just for troubleshooting purposes, we, al we, al we allocate the first IP of each slash 64 for the host, right? Because this is a very easy way to, for the network engineering team to actually de figure out, okay, is this a network problem, right? It's never the network. It's never the network. So how can a process use IPv6, right? We can pass it as environment variable. Uh, we can hack it with an LDP load. And then we, are, we can also do hacks like namespaces and IPv LAN. Uh, but we are experimenting with some stuff like that. So DNS support, right? We, have a, we implemented a DNS name per container. Uh, so this is an example, right, how it could look like. We create both quad A and PTR records for every task that gets created on the fly, right? We don't use DNS for any of our internal systems. We use other service directories, uh, discovery systems, but it's mainly for humans to actually, it's also actually more friendly to when you are uh, diving in a log to be able to see a host name, right? Uh, it actually reduces the operation to actually trace route to that random IP, right? So it's mainly for troubleshooting and be more human friendly. So on the kernel side, we support, uh, we, need, we, we make the use of lightweight tunnels, which is a really cool thing in Linux where you can basically slap an encap header in a routing action. And, um, and we program all this by a netlink, right? Of course, for troubleshooting purposes, you might wanna use the all known IP route command. And we actually have a binary modified and it's open source for this. Uh, to actually do this, right? So at the moment, as Jose says, ILA is a kernel, is, a kern, is, a, is built as a kernel module, right? So here you can see, as an example, 
how we could configure this manually. Of course, you won't, you're not going to do this for entire DC, but for troubleshooting purposes, it's really handy. So here you can see how we configure uh, the ID 255.255.0.1.0 with the SIR prefix that we have allocated for the network, and we bind it to the loopback address, to the loopback interface. Here we add a translation for the uh, 02 identifier. We add an action which is encapsulating ILA. And, and you see the BIA, right? The BIA is the actual, the VI is the actual default gateway. This slide is not actually accurate because all the hosts at Facebook have the same default gateway. Uh, and finally, here you can see how the local translation, right? Then in the end of the day, you need to add a local translation for the packets coming into you, right? So let's say the ILA routers, right? are Linux machines with basically IP6 forwarding, right? Um, we use this lightweight tunnels trick to, to do the ILA rules and cap. And basically all the hosts are ILA routers at the moment. There are operational implications. No, not everything is wonderful, right? ICMP, TTL expired and reachable, trace routes and stuff like that. As they are at the moment, they are broken, right? Because Basically, the network is not aware about these encaps, and the actual TTL expire message that you get is not the right one that you are expecting. Um, and we need to fix this in the kernel to actually make it work, right? This is really critical because we focus on operations first over features, and it's really important to get a buy-in on this and support for the rest of the infrastructure to be troubleshootable, right? So let's do a recap, right? What is ILA? So ILA is one address per process. We provide location independence, meaning that we reference things by its ID, the lower 64 bits, and um, it provides us the ability to move stuff around. Of course, it's IPv6 only. I mean, this is a public number, but nine, nine plus 99.99% .99 of the traffic at Facebook is V6. So of course, uh, this is IPv6 only. And, um, and we are really deploying this. Uh, we deploy this in all our data centers. We are deploying it in our edge network as we speak, like literally as we speak. And, um, and yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> Questions? So thank, thank you very much to, oh, we got one. With one hand? <laughs> Hi, Julian. Um, quick question, are you assuming IP4 will, di will disappear then? Is, is it Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, IP4, which, which this, this, ig this ignores, is all done by through proxying. Is that a significant thing for you, any legacy IP4 device? IP we currently don't have a, for us, IPv4 is a legacy technology, right? So um, we actually, we don't have an implementation to how to, let's say, to talk to ILA hosts that are on V4 and V6. I guess we could do some creative ways with NAT and stuff like that. But at the moment, it's not a use case that we need in our infrastructure. So since a couple of years or three, four years, three years ago or more, all our, all our clusters are V6 only. So we uh, still provide the ability to announce some services or v over V4, but we actually don't assign any more V4 addressing to our servers. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, apologies about the rain, who would have predicted thunderous, thunderous rain in Dublin in June? Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, my name's Colin. I'm a principal engineer in our networking group here in Dublin. Uh, I've been with Amazon for nine and a half years. Uh, before that, I was with Magnet Networks. Before that, I used to work with Brian and HANet. And then my start in networking was with a company called Unison, who, if anyone remembers, had this crazy idea of people were going to use the internet using a set-top box plugged into their television. Um, 
So web browsing at 640 by 480, it was, as you can tell, it was a runaway success. So um, I'm going to go through this talk pretty fast because we're short on time this evening. I want to give people a chance uh, to chat afterwards. Um, there is a longer version on YouTube. This is some material I'm recycling from a colleague. So you can also watch that. Or in the social time afterwards, you can ask me follow-up questions. Uh, just a word of like a health warning. Uh, I mailed our PR team and said, hey, I'm going to give this talk at Inaga. They went, great. We've got these slides you can use. Um, so these have been put together by a professional marketing person and not me as an engineer. I did my best to turn off all the animations, but uh, it turns out my PowerPoint skills are not as good as, as it's needed. Um, so I have to leave some of them in. Um, so um, Amazon's growing a lot. We're building a lot of stuff. The important thing about this data point from a networking point of view is we're having to add we're building new capacity every single day. And that makes it really easy for us to contemplate make, doing experiments or trying new things because it's not a once a year or a once every five years hardware refresh. It's a daily hardware refresh. So it's easy to introduce new um, technology. And so that's allowed us to try a bunch of experiments. Um, and then we can talk about where they've ended up. Um, one other thing just to talk about through this, I'm going to talk about, about how, how we approach certain classes of problems. That's how we've chosen to do it. I don't want anyone to think that I'm proclaiming those are the one true right best path. They work in our circumstances for our requirements. They may or may not be important to you. I'm going to talk about how some of the technology we've built or in, used is kind of transferable. Uh, one of those pretty animations, I couldn't figure out how to turn off. Um, so EC2, which is the primary thing driving the network, is all about elastic and scalability. This is a graphic from an internal talk relating to how Amazon.com, the retail enterprise, uh, uses EC2 and scales up and down the fleet. They've conveniently eliminated the y-axis, so it's not really useful. What I can tell you is that's peak for July last year for Prime Day. The increase there is in the order of tens of thousands of instances of servers. Uh, the retail team basically added tens of thousands of servers to the website for three weeks to support the ramp up to Prime Day and the ramp down afterwards, and then turned them off. Um, so what that means to as me as a network engineer is that's all great for them as a customer going, I can turn stuff off, turn stuff on. We have to build a network that can cope with that and that has enough headroom. It, it's great to be elastic and fluffy in cloud, but in my part of the business and infrastructure, we're down at the bare metal. And so we care about having to make these promises come true. Um, just some context in terms of what that infrastructure looks like in terms of global distribution. We have uh, EC2 regions in currently in 16 different places around the world. There's a bunch more in red under construction in the coming soon. Um, so as you see, they, they span pretty much most of the continents, not quite everywhere yet. Um, we have our content distribution pops scattered around another 74 of those. And then to hook it all together, we have, this, we have a shiny network, global network. Um, and the purpose of this network is to provide us with uh, capacity and uh, control. And control is really one of the important things about this, is that when customers want to move traffic between regions or between locations, we want to ensure it's successful. And just the more people that are involved in delivering traffic for you, the it harder it is to control. If you're passing between three or four different networks, there's just opportunities for something to go wrong, errors, operational support. So we've chosen to kind of, over the last couple of years, uh, invest quite heavily in this. And it was a contentious decision, like the business, we really didn't want to be a, ne a network op transport operator. Like initially, we, we kind of shied away from it. But the team here in Dublin were very heavily involved in pushing to say, no, we need to do this. We need to control this. We need to make it uh, better for our customers. And so that we've, we've built out this network. It spans all the way around. It's primarily uh, 100 gig based um, operated. And it's a mix of things. We're not. We're, we're very much not religious about how we approach a problem. We care very much about the outcome. So it's not just dark fiber. It's not just lease capacity. It, it's a whole mix of everything in order to solve the problems in different parts of the world. In some cases, it's wavelength swaps. It's spectrum on long haul networks. In some cases, it is actually dark fiber that we own and operate. Um, and I say it's 100 gig. What I really mean is it's composed of 100 gig wavelengths. Um, in many cases, it's multiples. Um, it's a bit hard to see, um, but like out of Ireland, we have four different subsea paths from Ireland into the UK and on into Europe, plus two different paths to the US out of Dublin. Um, 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit. I, I was going to talk a bunch about why that is, but I'm, we're going to be tight for time. But I will say this to the program committee. I'll happily come back and do a long segment on, on, on the craziness that it takes to just string a fiber between two continents. Um, but yeah, we're involved in a project to um, bring uh, a new cable between the US down to New Zealand and Australia. Um, one of the interesting challenges is actually Dublin to the UK, Ireland to the UK is actually one of the toughest places to run a subsea cable um, from an availability point of view. Is we have really bad weather in the winter, it's heavily fished, the composition of the seabed on the REC means the cables, even if they're buried, are quite likely to be exposed. So submarine cable breaks out of Ireland are actually really, really common. Um, that's one of the reasons we have four paths, is in the winter it's highly likely that at least two of those will be down for extended periods of time. And so um, actually just before I joined Amazon, one of my last jobs in Magnet was emergency capacity delivery because of that December, multiple subsea cables into Ireland had got breaks and everyone had realized, oh no, like both our primary and our backup paths just got cut. And it's the one cable repair ship has to repair both and they currently can't get out of the harbor because it's, it's gale force weather. So this is gonna take a couple of weeks. So, um, But yeah, I can come back and, and do a longer talk on just how crazy it is to try and string cables between uh, continents and countries. So how do we go about building what we call a region? So regions are composed of uh, multiple availability zones. Uh, availability zones is a very fancy word to describe failure domains. Uh, when we started, it used to just mean a data center. Um, and then it turns out the data center wasn't quite big enough, so it now got made out of multiple data centers. Um, we usually have, at a minimum, three availability zones in a region. Some of the bigger, bigger ones are five. This is actually a real uh, region. Uh, this is what happens when you take a network engineer's 2D simple Visio diagram and you send it to the marketing team. It comes back. Um, very, we're, not, we're not done yet. It's going to get better. But um, uh, this is actually real. This is not a made-up example. This is not a hypothetical. This is actually a production uh, build. So we have, in this case, five availability zones. Uh, in a region, we would also have two kind of what we call transit centers. They are locations that are usually um, kind of colos where lots of interconnection can happen. So that's where we would interconnect to people's subsea cable systems, to peering exchanges, to those of you who are here with, um, or to transit ISPs. So that's kind of the collection of buildings. And then how do we string a network out of it? Um, turns out we do it in a bunch of ways. So first off, we put some fiber between the buildings inside each availability zone to connect them together. So that's our nice light blue. There's a mesh of things. You'll see most of the buildings in, in the larger clusters have redundant paths to two other buildings. Everything's nice and redundant. Then again, we string some fiber connectivity between the different AZs in order to allow services to run. We see lots of parallel paths for maintenance and diversity, and it's, everything's obviously diverse. And then we hook it up together with links to the transit center. And so in this region, there's 126 unique physical spans, like in terms of ducts through the ground, cable routes. And there's just shy of a quarter of a million different fiber strands. Now you're probably going, how did you get from 126 things connected to needing a quarter of a million pairs of fiber? Well, it turns out there's a, there's a scaling point where traditionally you would do this with DWDM. You'd have one fiber pair and you'd run multiple circuits. Uh, it turns out once you're above a certain point, it actually ends up being cheaper to transition back to just doing bulk fiber and doing a single 10 gig or 100 gig si circuit per fiber pair because the cost of DWDM hardware is actually quite high currently. Uh, DWDM optics, and once, once you have to pull a cable through the ground because you've run out of fiber, it's basically free to add as many fiber pairs as you want, and then you can use cheaper optics. Um, and that was a great for a while, and then it turns out the ducts in the ground, those, those holes are only so big, and when you fill it, um, you don't want to have to dig up the street and put another duct in. So we worked uh, with some of our suppliers to build what's actually the densest fiber cable in the world. There's 3,456 cores, in slightly less than 50 millimeters. This is twice the density. When this was deployed last year, this is twice the density of the next large, next densest uh, cable. So I'll uh, have some examples, we can play with them later. Um, but there's three and a half thousand fiber cores in this cable um, flattened together. Um, it, takes, it takes a team of two people about 18 hours to connect them up if someone digs it up. 
Uh, <laughs> turns out, you know, if you chop it in half and then go, please glue it back together, it takes a while to, to line them all up. Um, but this allowed us to basically scale uh, inside the existing docs. And I have some other examples of slightly smaller ones where instead of the traditional 800 cores, that's like 1,700 uh, fibers in a single duct. Uh, and we're continuing to push on this. This is one of these interesting problems that when I joined a couple years ago, I never thought I'd be worried about the size of fiber cables. Um, but we're continuing to work with folks and trying to get this up over 5,000 cores in the same size. So this is, um, this is kind of where we're going. So yeah, there's a huge density of fiber and connectivity in here in order to actually basically string uh, the network together. Um, it also is great for kind of wandering around the office threatening people. Uh, <laughs> But we can play with that. Folks after can come up and we can, if you want to look at it, um, it's all really nice ribbons that are folded into Vs and then stacked. And then those Vs are kind of arrayed around the circle. So it's kind of really clever, like physical packaging, just to squeeze more cable into the same space. Um, OK, so yeah, then we talked about AZs are built out of data centers, uh, at least one, sometimes many more, lots of redundancy. Some of the bigger sites are about 300,000 servers, so they're, they're quite big. Um, data centers, usually we're in the kind of 25 to 30 megawatt range. Um, we deliberately don't build them any bigger than we could um, because it turns out there are, there are, there's no real cost advantage to going bigger, but there are lots of um, availability challenges in that if, if it turns out you built a 120 megawatt data center that was four times bigger than this, and it failed for some reason. Um, that's a lot of capacity to lose. It's much better to have four individual buildings and go one of them failed, and the other three are still running. And failures can come from lots of interesting dimensions. Like it's not just internally, there can be lots of external factors like road closures or flooding or um, occasionally happens is there's a fire in the building next door that's not us. And the fire marshal says, everyone must leave now, and you must turn off your data center. Um, and so there are lots of reasons for us to partition and minimize the blast of anything going catastrophically wrong. Uh, and all the data centers are redundant and can be maintained concurrently. So that kind of gives you a sense of just how big the infrastructure that the network is trying to support is. So how did we actually approach this? And so when I joined nine years ago, we were very much a traditional enterprise uh, data center operator. The network topology looked like a standard uh, data center build um, from a vendor and used vendor hardware. And that came with lots of problems as we grew. So traditional vendor platforms, and apologies to any vendors who are in the house, uh, they're complex. Like, they're incredibly, incredibly complex. You pull the line card out of a big chassis platform, it has dozens or more, like 40, 50 ASICs on the board that all have to work correctly for packets to be forwarding, and you've got like five of those line cards. So now you've got 200, 300 components that all have to work perfectly without causing impact. Um, they're expensive um, because they have all these parts. They have lots and lots of features that it turns out we didn't need um, that added to that. And then anytime you found a problem, uh, it used to take months and months to resolve if it was even possible to resolve. Um, I think some of my former colleagues will have heard me rant about some of the challenges of you know, a box that you have a problem with a box and you get on the phone to TAC and it, you're there for a couple of hours, and eventually they go, well, it's, that's not right. It doesn't work. And I'm like, great. Can we get the development team to come have a look at it? And they're like, we have no way to engage the person who wrote this code to tell us how to fix it. Um, we'll send them an email. Maybe they'll come back to us. And I'm like, my site's down. Like, like this is not OK. You need to tell me how to fix it. Or uh, one of the other fun challenges being this, well, this only happens sometimes, right? Uh, this like happens like one every 300 times, and I'm like, you know, I have to upgrade like 400 routers next week. So you're saying I'm going to take an outage? Uh, like things that were uh, acceptable at a small scale where it happened maybe very rarely, uh, at large scale suddenly happen all the time and, and are really challenging. So that drove us to look at moving to kind of simpler platforms. And so we started building uh, our own. Now, really, the primary driver for building our own was actually cost, because we firmly believed we could lower the cost. Turns out one of the benefits of building your own, our own platform and simplifying it was that we turned off 95% of the features and therefore turned off about 98% of the bugs. Because if, if, you, if you don't give people the option, then it, doesn't, it can't break. Um, <laughs> uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my key mantras that I drive into the team all the time is every time we give someone a choice, there's a chance they'll pick the wrong answer. 
Um, and, that, and so it's about eliminating that. The other thing it's about is about eliminating uh, testing complexity. If it turns out you have 10 different feature flags for in, in, your, in the thing, and even if they're all just on or off, like this, this mode can be enabled or disabled, that's 1,024 permutations that all have to be tested. No one really tests them all. So bugs will bake through. I make one of those something that's like 0 to 100, and you just blew out your test domain massively. So um, we started getting involved in kind of ODM switches and building our own. Now, I say these are hardware, they're, they're custom built to us. That's true, but most of those customizations compared to, say, a traditional white box vendor are very minor. They're things that are just unique to our environment, like we'd like this connector to be different, or could you line this thing up? Um, the difference between these and a white box switch from one of the established kind of ODMs, when compared to a big vendor platform, they're basically indistinguishable. Like the difference is very minute at that point. So this, a lot of these benefits of simpler platforms, simpler choices, are applicable to everybody now. I think that's one of the things that when we started this journey six-ish, seven years ago, no one was really doing kind of white box hardware at scale. It wasn't an established market. Uh, and so it was, it was very new. It was, something, it was very experimental. We, we really didn't think it was, it was a high risk. We were quite worried it was going to actually not work and not be successful. But now that, that is true. So you can do that, that kind of capability is there for anyone else in the market to just go buy um, a, a switch for only a few thousand, like few thousand dollars. I think the, the list price on the internet for a 32 by 100 gig switch is only, only $10,000. Like, and that's the no discount. I haven't haggled with anyone. Ship it to me tomorrow. Like, like that's, that's an incredibly low price. That's a few hundred uh, euro per 100 gig interface. Uh, on the same time, we have, we have some in-house protocol development folks working on the platform we run on the box. Uh, part of that is because we started early. There, the market, what we had to, there wasn't a market for us to consume. Um, but all the benefits that accrue from that, I think, are really applicable. Um, it's not in these slides, but one of the, I don't know, some of you may have come across a product we have called Snowmobile, which is basically the world's largest portable hard drive. It's a 45-foot truck that can store 100 petabytes of data and back it up to your data center. Um, the team in Dublin actually were responsible for the network for that, and we're using our own hardware, but we're using it in a way that wasn't supported by the off-the-shelf uh, team. And in, the, in, a, in a kind of vendory world, I'd have no choice. I'd be stuck. But because the platform was open, we could do some probably not very pretty stunts, like we could poke at the internals of the switch in order to unblock ourselves and try the experiment. Uh, because, you know, it has a bus shell. I can send debug commands directly to the ASIC to just change the modes. Um, and I don't need to wait on the vendor's permission, even though that vendor is, in fact, internal to Amazon. It allowed us to speed up. And I think that is something that white box platforms is applicable to the broader networking community is that with things like Cumulus, I know they've been presented at INOG or other vendors, is that you get much more access to the platform and that allows you to experiment or just self-serve and going, this is broken, why can't I help troubleshoot it? So that's, that's been one of the big advantages for us is that we have that ability to experiment and control. And then one of the other things that we've done in the latest generation uh, is that we, we kind of jumped straight to 25 gig ethernet. We didn't really bother with 40 gig. And there's some really good reasons for that. And um, At the time, again, it was one of those things that was high risk. Everyone was 10 and 40 gig were the standard. No one really had optics available for 25 gig. But the reason we did it is that to build a 40 gig interface, it's actually four 10 gig interfaces. Inside the optic, there are four lasers, there are four receivers, it's four lanes on the PCB. So it basically costs four times what a 10 gig costs. Um, 25 gig is a single lane, so it's a single laser, it's a single receiver, it's a single part of the board. Um, so 50 gig interface built out of 25 gig parts uses half of the parts of a 40 gig interface. So it should cost half as much. And that's really one of the interesting secrets is that the cost to build a 40 gig interface and the cost to build a 100 gig interface are exactly the same. So again, for any of the vendors in the room, sorry, the secret's out. Um, you know, if they're charging you more for 100 gig than 40 gig, you need to have that conversation, that the component cost. And when the move happens to 400 gig in a couple of years, the same will be true. A 400 gig interface will cost the same as 100 gig has cost. Um, and so that's, 
So that's really been one of the interesting things we've watched as, as kind of Moore's law and a big uh, ecosystem kicks in. So speaking of Moore's law, let's talk about the actual silicon inside these. Um, so that's our current generation, 32 by 100, 128 by 25 gig switch. It runs a slightly customized version of a Broadcom Tomahawk ASIC. Um, again, just some tweaks specific to our environment. The Tomahawk ASIC is the most complicated silicon chip made. Like it is more complicated than any, any Xeon CPU. It consumes more power, it's physically bigger. It is at the very limit of uh, what can be built in a silicon foundry. Like they're, they're incredible pieces of engineering because it has to ship 3.2 terabits of traffic at line rate all the time. Like it's, it's, it's doing billions and billions of operations. So it's a really impressive thing. Um, one of the great things about uh, commodity merchant silicon ASICs is they, like CPUs, follows Moore's law. That 3.2 terabit switch costs the same as the 1.2 terabit switch it replaced. The 6.4 terabit switch that will come next year in the future will cost the same, and the 400 gig switch after that will cost the same. Moore's law is a really powerful factor in that capacity goes up and cost stays flat. Um, and so that's been a really big advantage. There's a really great healthy ecosystem now in the merchant silicon space. There's five, six vendors, Cavium, Mellanox, you know, bare, Barefoot. There's lots of folks building stuff. So it's a really um, big, healthy market for everyone to play in. And so yeah, that's, that's kind of that. And then the other part of where we've started doing some funky stuff in networking is actually in the server world. So we've been doing SDN for a long time, since even before it was called SDN. Um, back in 2012, we started to move some of the features on the server into the network card, um, running our own s software on the network card, offload some of the virtualization features. Um, turns out one of these interesting things, as you move features into hardware out of software, they run 10 times faster, they cost 10 times less in power, and they cost 10 times less to make. So it, at a certain point, uh, hardware optimizing really starts to pay off. And so this led to a bunch of features where we did like uh, enhanced networking and SRV. I got us down to a really low latency, like 70 microseconds. Um, and then there's an evolution of that where we wanted 25 gig NICs and no one was making them. Um, so we built them ourselves. We have a subsidiary called Annapurna that made the ASIC that we now put in pretty much every server, at least one if not more, uh, that handles all of the network traffic and allows us to take features and off and move them from the OS, from the server world, and push them down into the network card and, and accelerate uh, customer features. And that allowed us to do things like launch a 20 gig ethernet adapter, because it turns out that's just something you can do in software. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one of those things where we've poked around and we've, we've done some stuff in terms of the ASICs. And that's kind of my core material. How are we doing on time? Do we want to go to stop or do we want to throw in some bonus stuff? <laughs> okay, two minutes. We'll throw in some bonus stuff. I had some backup. Um, so just, this is kind of some other stuff on servers. Um, sorry? No, 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 don't worry. Um, so this is, this is a, uh, one of our recent server storage rack designs. It has 1,110 hard drives in it when it was built a couple of years ago. Uh, would, with the time it was about, with eight terabyte drives, that was 8.8 .8 petabytes. With current drives, that would be just over 11 petabytes. Uh, the fun part is it weighs over a ton. Uh, your actual challenge becomes how strong are the floors in your data center. Um, um, uh, so that's kind of that's one of the things we've done in storage. Um, it's a big, giant storage rack. Um, there's a bunch of those. Floating around, they're, they're kind of being phased out for some newer stuff. Can't show you the really secret stuff, uh, unfortunately. And then on the, the server side, this is the type of compute server you'll see in an Amazon data center. Um, one of the things you'll notice about it is it's pretty empty. There's not actually a lot of stuff there. Um, this is not your high density blade type platform, because it turns out that it's very efficient in terms of power usage or thermals. And so it actually turns out the right answer from a cost point of view was to do um, a really kind of low density design with really good airflow, really high efficiency power um, stuff. And that's still a, a really good platform. And I think we'll, we call it there. Yeah.
I will say, I was going to talk about the, the trials of airlines and power events, but I feel that's bad form. <laughs> <laughs>